Now, dozens of soldiers from Greater Manchester are risking their lives every day fighting in, Afga if in Afghanistan. As we know only too well, there have also been fatalities among troops from this area in the battle against the Taliban. And the Manchester Evening News reporter Deborah Linton spent ten days with British troops. Here's her account of what life is like on the front line. We've just walked 300 metres across open ground of desert to arrive at Camp Wokab. We're right on the front line, literally prayed every step of the way. Um, and now we're here, um, it's about midnight, um, and um, we're sleeping in essentially a mud hut, which used to be a compound, for, for, it used to be a family home. Um, now we've got to get a few hours kit before a patrol starts in the morning. We're currently sat in um, a small urban area. We are um, about three kilometres north of Musa Khan um, in Helmand Province. And um, we're patrol base Wokab, as where B Company, the 2nd Battalion Royal Regiment Fusiliers, is based. We cover an area of heavily irrigated, what's known as green zone, heavily irrigated land, a maze is grown. We also have this area that we're in now of what we call desert compounds, which are inhabited compounds, very close alleyways, as you can see here, see around us, and um, occupied with some shops and some small numbers of local nationals. Uh, this morning we um, went out on patrol to go and dominate, really, and deter um, the enemy from um, attacking our patrol base at Wake Up. It's been attacked a few times recently. The, um, by pushing uh, some of our soldiers forward, what we did was um, we deterred the enemy. They could see that we were there in strength. Uh, they could see that we have, uh, had aircraft overhead, and so they deterred from some of Our effort really is to ensure that the local population understand that the government of Afghanistan and ISAF in support of it are keeping security, and so we do this to deter the Taliban whenever we can. We've just come in off foot patrol. It's about 11.30 here and around 50 degrees. We've been up since 5.30 this morning. The guys went out on a patrol to basically push forward into Taliban territory, um, a show of force, basically, um, and we watched from the rooftop of a, of a compound, which is um, the northernmost British patrol base in Musakala. Um, as mortars went off, you could hear some gunshots in the background, and the guys finding IEDs, so they're having to divert their routes, create smoke screens to keep the enemy at bay while they come back into camp. Um, we then did the walk back out. You know, I only had a small pack on my back, um, and it was really hard work, really tiring, really hard work, searing heat across the open land, tense waiting to see if someone was going to attack or not. I, I just don't know how they do it. Well, Deborah is with us now. Welcome. Thank you. Were you scared? Yes. <laughs> um, at times, yes. Um, when we went out on patrol, which you just heard me talking about, um, we were dropped in the desert in the dead of night. You can't see anything except for you, the soldiers you're with, just sort of their silhouettes lit by moonlight, really, and you just know that the enemy's all around. Um, you just have to follow closely the person in front of you because the path's been sweep for bombs and you're just walking and waiting to get to your destination, really. It's funny, because I would have thought, as a journalist, you might have a false sense of security because you're not actually there to fight a war, mm. you're there to report it. Is that not the case at all? You still have the same fears? I think in, in some respects I did, and you certainly, when you're at the main international camps like Camp Bastion or Kandahar, you do have a false sense of security because they're actually secure enough that you don't have to wear body armour. But... Trust me, when you get out on the ground there, there's no sense of security. The, en the enemy don't know whether you're a journalist no. or a soldier, do they? You're just... If anything, I thought, they've all got khaki on. I'm in a blue vest and, <laughs> and helmet. So, but they, the enemy don't care anyway. Tell me about the changes that the soldiers go through. I know you were only there for the ten days, but you must have seen it. I mean, the, 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 the line that people like to say is they go out as, you know, boys and come back as men. Is it really mm -hmm. like that? Um, that's what people say to me, but I was really struck um, by how young they seem to be going through what they are. It, it really upset me, actually. I was talking to one guy who was certainly no older than 19. He was a, a real boy soldier, and he looked a boy soldier, and he'd been in a blast in Musakala about three weeks ago now, and five of his friends had died. 
and he just looked shell-shocked and I said to him how on earth do you motivate yourself to go back out and he just sort of laughed it off a bit and said oh you know it's the job but I just thought how on earth are you dealing with that and how did you deal with it because I've in the Manchester Evening News today that you have quite an emotional piece which it's unusual, we don't normally see that side to it, we normally have it just reported to us mm. and here are the facts. How did you actually deal with it all? Um, I dealt with it fine, but when I got home I felt quite emotional, only because of the people I'd spoken to and it just, I think it, actually going and experiencing it, it really hits home how intense it is. The conditions are horrible just because of the nature of where it is. It's 50 degree heat. They're carrying so much kit. They're sleep the ones who are right on the front line are sleeping in the most basic of accommodation and just seeing what they're dealing with. And I, and I think it was seeing them and thinking, gosh, some of you are so young. Do they need more kit? This has been the big debate at home and it's been, you know, the Prime Minister's come in for a lot of stick from this from David Cameron. Do they need more equipment, Deborah? Um, a lot of the debate's been about helicopters. Yeah. Uh, with helicopters, yes, I believe they need more helicopters. However, I do believe there's been some, some misconception as to what good that would bring. I think when there have been so many um, deaths in IEDs on roadside bombs, people have been saying, well, let's bring in helicopters, that'll save lives. Actually, the helicopters can't be used on those foot patrols. They can't be used on vehicle patrols. So helicopters would be great because it would allow them to get the kit to the guys quicker. Things like mail, that some of them are getting mail once a month and that's the only thing that they and say... And for morale, well, mail is yeah, really important, That is the it? one thing, if you say... I mean, morale's not bad, to be honest, but if you say, what do you really want? It's mail, it's, it's a little something from home to boost their morale. So helicopters, yes, would help that. I believe they need more of the better armoured vehicles, the Mastiffs and the Warriors, because they're the ones that save lives. No one's ever died in a Mastiff. OK, we could talk at length, but uh, we must move on. Deborah, thank you for giving thank us you. your thoughts. One of the most remarkable examples of bravery to emerge from, Asga from Afghanistan involves Fusilier Stephen Stratton. He's from Littleborough. He's cheated death on no fewer than five occasions in the space of a week, and he's been telling to us why he's lucky to be alive. You've um, basically cheated death five times this week. Tell us about the various incidents. The first was while you were on the Sangha. Yeah, I was, uh, I was on duty, force protection, on, a, on one of our sangers, and uh, I heard a, heard a whoosh sound from one of the uh, firing points. It was a sort of smoke plume, RPG inbound. So I shouted uh, RPG, uh, got my head down, RPG hit the front of the sanger, uh, got myself together. Once the smoke cleared, got up, uh, engaged the enemy with the GPMG, and uh, 20 seconds later, it just went uh, it was black, blackness from the right hand side of my head. And um, 30 seconds later, I got one of my mates standing over me, shaking me. I told I'd been hit by the side. Uh, another RPG at the side of the sanger, uh, knocked me clean out for 30 seconds. Two days later, went out on patrol, had to clear an area for a route back resupply. Found uh, two IEDs, found an uh, anti tank mine stacked on top of an uh, anti personnel mine with a tamper device, pressure pad. And then 30 metres away from that, I found a uh, remote controlled IED pressure cooker both vehicle but you could be set off on foot so and then there was the incident while you were out on patrol which you described to me as the most terrifying thing you've experienced yeah we'd uh patrol base had been attacked and we'd been uh our platoon some platoon had been tasked to go out and uh, counter attack the enemy push them back towards their flat forward line of enemy troops so uh we pushed out we heard over the icon that they were in position ready to attack us and uh, as myself and uh, three other blokes were pushing forward, we came under very accurate uh, enemy fire. So we, uh, we dived into cover and uh, we were completely pinned down from the rest of the platoon. We had, uh, we had no backup, just, just flanking mm. protection. And uh, there was accurate rounds coming in for a good 40 minutes, two, three inches above my head. And I can honestly say it's the scariest thing I've, I've ever known. And uh, the uh, platoon commander was around the corner, 10 metres behind us in an alley. He gave the order for rapid fire. He came running around the corner, and the platoon commander took one in the chest. But uh, luckily, his body armour did the job, and uh, the round just bounced off. How do you motivate yourself to get back out? Um, it's all about being out here with the lads. You know, what one for all and all for one. It's just do it for the lads. You don't do it for anything else. That's it. <laughs>